In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> well, today we are at the end of our series on the drama of Scripture. The uh, focus being that the Bible is one story, not a collection of di disjointed stories or fables or tales, but it's one real story. And what we've looked at is creation. The creation account tells us where we come from. The fall answers the question why there's something wrong with everything. God's rescue plan tells us that God didn't just stand back in a disinterested way, but he immediately started to formulate a plan to rescue us from the fall. The rescue and deliverance we see through the prophets who were telling of a, a Messiah who was to come. And in Jesus Christ, we see God born into this world, living the life that we live. And it answers the biggest life question of all. What is God like? God's like Jesus. When you're looking at Jesus, you're seeing the face of God. And finally today, the final victory. The story is not over. We're not just biding time until we die, quote unquote, die and go to heaven. There's something else that is yet to happen. And we're going to look at that today. This is the last act of the story of the Bible. And it addresses the basic question, what does the future hold? How is this all going to end? Is there any hope beyond this? We talked in the past that the kingdom of God <clears throat> is like a train that has arrived. But it hasn't yet stopped at the platform. The doors haven't yet opened, but it's here. We can see it. The train is the beginning of the final victory, the restoration. So this morning we're going to look at why restoration is a victory, why restoration brings the justice that we crave, while restoration is reality, it's real, it's solid, and finally why restoration is present, it's a hope for now. So restoration, first of all, is the victory of Christ. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 3. <clears throat> we'll go through our usual Bible exercise, which ensures you can find things in any Bible by opening it up halfway. And then going to the right, you're in the Old Testament now, you're going to go to the right, and you're going to look for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in about the last quarter of the book. And then right after John, you're going to find the book of Acts. Isn't that cool? Now you can... <laughs> You can use any Bible, okay? And look at what it says in verse 19. This is Peter speaking to the crowds. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of the prophets long ago. So this word from Peter really frames the context for the end of time, the, the last judgment, the second return of Christ. And you look at the words he's using, times of refreshing, restoration. Restoration, not to the original condition, but to the original intent. How many of you had a fender bender, ever had a fender bender, right? Well, I mean, I've had one too. So you take the car to the auto body place. The auto body place will only fix what? The thing that, the accident that you got into this time. All the other dings and scratches, the leaks and the motor and all that stuff, they're not going to do anything with that. So they're only going to repair. It's a patchwork thing. At the end of time, on the last day, it'll be a restoration to showroom new our physical bodies, and the world that we're seeing now, the world that we live in right now, that's a fallen world. So it's not just restoration to original intent. Jesus, how many of you know Jesus was not resuscitated? Right? He didn't come back to the original condition of being a man again so that he'd have to die all over again. He was resurrected. He was transformed. There were a lot of things that were the same and a lot of things that were just beyond anybody's imagination. You could feel him. You could hug him. 
His had the same eyes and personality and voice. He even ate with them. And yet, he wasn't limited by walls anymore or time or space. It was a trans-dimensional existence beyond the reach of evil and limitation. That's where you're headed. That's where the earth is headed. So this is a wonderful thing we're talking about in terms of this final victory. Resurrection is not just our human bodies, it's the plants, it's the air, it's the sky. It's the answer to all the decay that we see around us in this, what is still a beautiful world. God loves this earth. He loves the soil. He made this. He's going to restore it. Think of that when you're planting grass this spring. And it's a resurrection over sin and evil. On the cross, Jesus defeated Satan. Right now, we're living in a guerrilla war with a guy who's been defeated, but he doesn't know it, right? When Jesus comes back, it'll be a victory over sin. Death will be gone forever. The restoration will do a second thing. It will settle accounts. With the restoration of all things in this final victory, justice will happen. How many of you know that you just cannot live with any kind of hope under constant injustice? Right? I mean, you just keep getting passed over for promotions. Uh, people keep getting away with everything. You can't live very long in, 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 with any kind of hope if there's just constant injustice. We are built to want to see justice. You will see even the most immoral person who has no grounding at all in any kind of religious uh, background, anybody will find a point in life where they say, that's just not right. You know, And that's when you can ask them, well, yeah, what's the standard then? It's built into us. We want to see justice. Well, at the end, history will be uncovered. All the hidden motives will be exposed. The spiritual warfare that has shaped world events will be exposed. When Jesus says on the cross, it is accomplished, he's talking about this. The final justice has been accomplished. And we'll see that in the end. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross upends evil and sin and death. And we need to know that because we live in an unjust world. We need to look at the cross every time we see injustice. And what seems like it will never be made right, we need to look at the cross and say, but it will be made right. Nobody's going to get away with anything. That's what the cross means. So what does that mean for you and me as Christians? We're getting into something here where I think there's just massive ignorance in the Christian church and even worse outside of it. Will Christians be judged what do you think? Yeah, we'll be judged, right? Evil, the bad things that we've done, they don't just go away. They go into the body of Christ. He takes it into himself. So he pays the price for all of our failings. It goes into him. And it's only then that we'll realize through the good or the evil that we've done in life what the grace of God really means. Remember when Jesus says, he who is forgiven much loves much? When you're forgiven a tremendous debt, isn't there tremendous gratitude that comes with that? That's what we're going to experience in the judgment of Christ. See, it's not about condemnation, it's about commendation. God's going to look at us and whatever evil we've done, he's going to say, that all went into my son. He lived the perfect life that you couldn't live, but he gave you all the credit. Congratulations. Welcome to the kingdom. So we have nothing to fear at the last judgment. Isn't that amazing and freeing and wonderful? Okay, so what about all the stuff uh, that we read in Revelations about the destruction of the world and horrific torments and stuff like that? Where does that all go? Well, that goes.
goes into the new heaven and the new earth. What's happening there is when we're seeing that, we're not seeing that happening to the people of God. We're seeing it happen to evil. Evil is being destroyed. When Jesus is referred to in Isaiah 42, the prophet says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I've put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. So restoration at the end means victory, it means justice, and it also means that it's going to be real. We have this kind of bad habit as Christians of talking about real things and spiritual things. We talk about our real life out there in the real world, and inside here we talk about spiritual things, as if they're not concrete, consequential, or existent in any way. The restoration is all about material things and solid things that become transcendent, but they don't stop being solid. You're going to be raised to a solid and real body. This earth that has been so beat up and polluted and worn out, it is going to be restored as a solid earth. We're seeing some of it here, but we're just shadows of who we're going to become. Even the beautiful day that we have here, it's just a shadow of what this earth is going to be like. Get it? So we're not going up to play, you know, harps in the clouds. You know, the highest existence with God is not some ethereal, disembodied existence. It's solid. It's like this. You see, because that's what God made. When you read Genesis, you don't read, and God thought in his mind, Let's just have thoughts about what a world would look like. That's good enough, you know. He doesn't do that. He creates a real earth. He's going to restore a real earth, okay? Very, very important for us to understand and to know. Revelations 21 gives us a vision. John is seeing this, and he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. The entire universe is going to give way to the new. Think of it like this. What happens when there's an eclipse of the sun? Right? The moon goes in front of the sun, and the sun's, to our sight, gone, right? Has it blown up? And be, has it been destroyed? It just gives way. It's getting eclipsed. That's what's going to happen. And this is important. Uh, because in order for the dwelling of God to be with us, we have to have a proper understanding of creation, a proper understanding of the end. Listen to this. It's from the book, The Drama of Scripture, that we've been, we've been following here. It's not destruction and remaking. It's renewal and restoration. The destruction, the horrific fireballs of hell, are for the enemy of our souls, for Satan and for his kingdom. You see? So we can say with Paul in Romans 8 that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. All right? So instead of the world blowing up and then it gets replaced, what we're seeing here, Scripture telling us things as they are now will give way. They'll just be eclipsed. We won't even remember them. You see? Now, why is this important? We live in a cultural prejudice as Christians. And it kind of goes like this. Oh, yeah, you're a Christian. You guys, all you talk about is the end of the world. Everything's going to be destroyed with fire and cataclysmic stuff. Okay? That's one. Everybody's going to hell unless they're like you, a hypocrite. Right? And third... So the rest of the time here, all you're here to do is judge who's in and who's out. No thanks. You ever hear that? Or some combination of that? That's not going to change until we become biblical Christians concerning where history is going. For one thing, you can tell them, look, there's something headed this way, and it's not a killer asteroid. It's a new heaven and a new earth. Think about that. People don't hear that out there who are not believers. They're just hearing the lore. You know, and when people say, uh, oh yeah, everybody's going to go to hell unless they're like you. You guys are just judgmental. 
don't play the game. That's not the gospel. Jesus, when did Jesus ever commission us to be the judge and jury of the world? If anything, we're told to judge ourselves within the church. Yeah, we got plenty that we can judge, plenty that we can confront. But not them. They don't know any better. You see how important this is? So when somebody says in this context, all right, hot shot, is X a sin? You know, is this person, are you saying that this person is going to go to hell? Don't play the game. You can say, I'm not obliged to answer that. I was never commissioned by God to be the judge and the jury of who's going to go to heaven and who's going to go to hell. Somebody else is going to do that. It's not me. You see how important that is? Don't fall into that trap. Don't fall into the trap of ignorance either within the body of Christ or outside of it with regard to the end and how that's... Is this clear? Is this kind of making sense here? This is very important in the 21st century if we're going to turn things around as the church witnesses for Christ. Jesus' own resurrection tells us something of what this life is going to be like. You know, when people say, well, what's heaven going to be like? What's it going to be like to be in the presence of God? What's going to be like Jesus' resurrection? Right? Just as I said before, there's some things that are natural, some things that are just going to be supernatural, but all of it is going to be beyond the reach of evil and sin. It's all good, just the way God pronounced it. So, the last thing we see is that restoration is for now. A lot of Christians believe the point of life after receiving Christ trusting in him for your acceptance with God is a waiting game that you've got your ticket punched and you keep it in a safe place along with your social security card right (laughs) so that you can wait to die to go to heaven right where in the Bible does it say that that's the point of living to the glory of God nowhere nowhere that's not it you don't just Well, I believe in Christ. Now I'm safe. All I got to do is wait, not screw up on camera, you know, or Facebook. And then when I die, I'll go to heaven. You know, that was a medieval superstition. In fact, some people wouldn't even get baptized until they were on their deathbed because they didn't want to screw it up, right? So they would wait until they were dying. They'd get baptized. They were pretty sure then they wouldn't sin. Complete, (laughs) Complete myth because to be human is to sin. Right? It's not an act as much as an orientation. You can see how the ignorance has crept in here. You know, and we really need to turn this around in our own minds, become biblical Christians when it comes to where history is going. Restoration means life now. So what does that mean with regard to North Korea rattling their sabers this morning, threatening to start a nuclear war? What does that mean when you read, I don't know if you saw it this week, Stephen Hawking's uh, opinion that the human race will not survive the next thousand years until, unless we can find another planet to live on because this one just won't, it's just not going to make it. How, how does that square when people say to you, look, I just don't believe in any of this stuff. I'm glad that you're happy with religion. I have my only kind of religion. Uh, you know, I'd live for the paycheck and for Saturday night, and, you know, fine, great. Do what you're going to do. I don't care about any of this stuff. What's your answer to that? What do you say to people? Hope means something is ahead of you, something good, something wonderful, something to live for. We're living at a time where people are fast losing that. The hope of the American dream is crashing and burning, Right? I mean, there's a lot of things that we had hoped for that were just part of what we would pass on to the next generation. Well, they're becoming increasingly not there. So where's the hope? The hope is in where history is going to be concluding and how it affects our living life now. How much of your future is tied up in the way things are? If you're thinking about your future just in terms of the way things are, you're going to be ineffective in the kingdom of God. You're going to be just somebody sitting there along with everybody else saying, yeah, it stinks for us. But if your hope is in where 
future is going to be culminated, then you've got something that will change your life. Restoration is already happening. Every time you pray for somebody, every time you pray for yourself, every time you open your Bible, which promises to never go out and return void, restoration has already happened. Something eternal is already happening. It's now. It's not you die and go to heaven. That's not the point. Restoration is happening now. And so we can be confident with St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. And we can also memorize this and let this be our answer to people who challenge us with those, those other things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. What a wonderful way to be a Christian in the world. Don't you feel the lightness and the lifting of the burden? To say to people, especially if they're hostile or challenging us, say, you know what, I, I see things very scrambled right now. I don't know the answer to these things that you're saying. And I'm not supposed to. That hasn't been given to me. Isn't that a relief to not be obliged to be the punching bag of the world? You know? And to, in truth, say, guess what? We don't know everything. Becoming a Christian doesn't make you somebody who knows everything. There's only one person you need to know, and that's Jesus Christ. That's all you need to know. You don't need to know everything else and timetables and whether we're going to be raptured or a thousand years or not a thousand years. It's going to happen, folks. It doesn't matter what we think. Victory, justice, real solid reality and a hope for now. The train is pulling in, brothers and sisters. We haven't yet boarded, but it's coming. Alleluia. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.